You know, those cocktails got me thinking. It's time to redo our coffee mill. And someone sent me a roaster and some green beans and some uh, beans that they roasted because I just haven't had time to try out the roaster yet. I'm really sorry about that. So first step in making a coffee mill is make some coffee. Okay, so to make our cold brew coffee, we're going to be using this. No, really, Mark Manning sent us this, and he just happened to reuse a jar. I mean, you know, I give him credit for that. These are his personally roasted beans, because I haven't figured out the roaster yet. And we're just going to use those. We're going to put them into our grinder. And for best results, you really want to use a hand grinder or something that has the uh, ceramic grinder wheels in it, because that way you're going to get the best. Oh, wow, this smells so good. This coffee's so good. Uh, and that way you get a more consistent grind. Because if you just throw it into, oh, it's a burr grinder. That's what it is, burr grinder. If you just put this into like a spice grinder or something like that, they just blitz it and it doesn't really make for consistent sizes. So that way your coffee comes out sometimes bitter, sometimes not enough extracted. Yeah, so that, and then we grind. The grinding is the hardest part. <laughs> and that's it for that one. Let's see about how much we got here. That looks like a little over half a cup. Actually, that might even be a full cup. Yeah. That's a full cup of, that is a full cup of coffee ground up. So we're gonna go with that. And I'm gonna use the rumble jar. If you don't know what a rumble jar is, it's basically just an aluminum filter that you can uh, pour your coffee grounds into like so. Pop the lid on like so. I don't know why I'm saying like so. I never say like so. And then I'm gonna put that into a one gallon fermenter like so. And then we pour some water in. Now I'm gonna pour three quarters of a gallon of water into this. Why am I doing three quarters of a gallon? Because we're going to ferment in this when we're done. And that way, it's very simple. All we have to do is remove the coffee and add in our honey and we're good to go. All right, as you can see, it's already starting to turn the water into coffee, but we're gonna put a lid on this, let it sit on the counter for 24 hours and we'll be back with you then to add the honey to make our mead. We've made our coffee. It is steeped for 24 hours. We sanitized everything in. The pitcher of sanitization. <laughs> so what we do when we just have a small amount that we need to sanitize is then I just use a pitcher rather than our huge tub because it takes a lot of space. And again, we're in a tiny house. So anything that sticks above the pitcher, I simply take my baster and I baste it with sanitizer fluid. Okay, let's let's move that off to the side for a minute. Which is right in front of me. That's yep. okay. I'm sorry. Because we gotta deal with the coffee. Did you get something to put the coffee in? I got something to put the rumble jar in. Do you think that's big enough? I think it's big enough. I don't know that it is, but I think it is. Okay, so this has been sitting for 24 hours at room temperature. And I'm just going to reach in Grab the rumble jar by its silicone lid. Drain it off. Because the holes are actually on the side, not on the bottom. So you want to kind of hold it sideways. Every drip counts. And then... Ta-da! See it fit. No fuss, no muss. It smells so good. Okay. That is a really good coffee. So I, I believe... Whoops. We have some extra now. Yep. See that? And that'll happen. Um, I believe, and I mean, obviously, the better the coffee, the better the final product. Now, last time, I think we used a Starbucks coffee that we got ridiculed for pretty severely. I actually liked that coffee, but I understand. So we used a much higher quality coffee this time that was roasted by hand by one of our viewers, Mark Manning, and he sent some to me. Not only saw. did he send us some coffee, he sent us the, the roaster, roaster so that we he could used roast our own so coffee, we can make our own. plus 
three different types of green yeah. coffee for us to roast in our new Unbelievable. roaster. Unbelievable. I just haven't had a chance to get into it yet, but one of these days I'm going to sit down and spend a day just roasting up some coffee and the whole house is going to smell amazing, just so you know. But anyway, so what I want to do now is put this whole thing onto our scale. Now, we did actually sanitize this before we started. So everything has sanitized. We don't need this again, but it's been sanitized. We are now going to add our honey. And we are using, what kind of honey are we using, babe? We're using donated honey from the Pinellas chapter of beekeepers. I probably said that wrong. Pinellas, Pinellas Beekeepers Association. There we go. How um, much are we using? We are using three pounds. Hopefully, as long as that's what I actually get out of this. This was given to us for doing a presentation for them. We spoke at their uh, most recent meeting and um, it was an interesting time. There was like a hundred people in the room. Got to teach them all about mead. Give them something else to, whoa. Oh, close, close, close. Give them something else to do with all that honey that they make. This is gonna be very close. I did use 96 ounces of water to make the coffee. We're almost there though. Got a little greedy on this one. <laughs> uh, hey, we're almost there. Oh boy. Yeah, this is, this is close. Three there pounds. There you go. Okay. So that's three pounds of honey. Um, so our concerns are that if the yeast gets super happy in this, we're going to need a blow off tube. Yeah. My other concern is trying to mix this up. Oh yeah. Yeah. I have to mix this too. I need a spoon to sanitize for you because I didn't do that. Or do you want to do just the let it eventually get to the sugar? Um, trick? we could do that. Because we actually did a test on this theory of whether yeast can get to the sugar, whether it's stirred in or not, and they don't care. They'll get to it and they'll eat it. The only difference is you don't get an accurate original gravity reading, but we kind of have a very approximate reading of 1.105. How did I get to that? Because three pounds of honey should be 0 0.035 times three or 1.105. And you're hearing Tigger off in the background. So he needs. Being needy. Are you gonna stop? Shh. 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 Okay. <laughs> Whenever he does that, particularly with Tigger, because they have lovely conversations, it reminds me of Austin Powers. I'm just going to say that. She stopped. She did. That's daddy's little girl. She listens to me. Anyway, so we have that and we had 96 ounces of the coffee. Now we know that three pounds of honey takes up roughly a quart, almost exactly a quart, with the 96 ounces, which is three quarts. So that gives us a full gallon. Going to add some Fermate O, 2.5 grams mixed in with a little bit of water. So we do have just a slight amount more than that exact one gallon, but it's not really enough to worry about. So I'm gonna call our final, I'm gonna call our starting gravity 1.100. Can you take a note? I'm gonna take a and note on that. to make sure that we put today's date. Yes, we do. Which is March 1st. Happy March, everyone. Happy Mandalorian day. Now I'm approximating that, but it's probably within a few points of that. So it's close enough for homebrew work. Um, it should come out to about 13% or so, 13.5, somewhere in there. And so the last that. thing we need to add is yeast. And today we just happen to have in the yeast storage area, which is a mini fridge, thank you very much, a half packet of Mangrove Jacks MO5. Now we know the Mangrove Jacks works excellent as a mead yeast, so that's what we're going to use. Also has an 18% tolerance. And uh, what do you do? Back your packet! Be careful when you're this close to the top because there's nowhere for those particles to go. You don't want them to fly all over the place. Um, I don't mix them in anymore, except this time I'm going to because I had a little mound. Moundy, moundy. The surface tension was not allowing it to fall oh, in. They're falling. They're yeah, falling. they're falling now. Get in there, yeasties. Um, so yeah, this is this is a little bit unusual, but this is part of homebrewing. You encounter an issue, you figure out a way around it. So not mixing the honey. What that's going to do is kind of make a forced, uh, staggered. Uh, nutrient. From, no, well, not, not nutrient. nutrient. Staggered. It's like, it's a, like step a step feed. feed. Yep. Yeah, that's what I meant to say. It's like a forced step feed because the yeast can only get to so much honey at a time. So they're going to only consume what they can. Then they're going to go to the next step and the next step and the next step. And it usually, usually 
results in less stress on the yeast. So we'll find out because sometimes that's a very, very good thing, um, especially in a brew that could be a little bit on the acidic side, like coffee. Coffee can be a lower pH. So we will have to keep an eye on that. I don't really want to do a, a test of the pH today because I don't think that's necessary. If we end up with a stall or something like that, we'll worry about it at the time. But for now, we're going to put lid and an airlock on it. We are also going to set this on a cookie sheet with edges because oh, we yeah. are super close to the top of this. Oh, so yeah. when the yeast start consuming those sugars and transferring them into alcohol and gas, which they do at basically level amounts, it's going to start pushing gas up and pushing everything up. And if yeah. they get really excited, it's just going to be pushing all probably this Probably going to be using a blow-off tube within And all the next this liquid is going to come out and it's probably going to erupt. Again, that was Tigger. And it's probably going to erupt out and pour out and make a big sticky mess. So yeah. if we have this on a cookie sheet with edges. Or a pot. All that sticky mess is going to be collected in that area rather than spread across our kitchen. And uh, what are we going to do with this now after we put it on a tray? We're going to let it sit. A couple weeks. Uh, when I see that the airlock activity has fallen to nearly nothing, we'll be back to show you what it looks like. All right, so it's been like uh, 21 days, which is exactly three weeks. It's time to check on the coffee melt. Now, here's why we're going to check on it. You see that airlock? Notice the levels. Pretty much not moving. It's not bubbling, anything like that. Does that mean anything? No. Well... It's simply an indicator that perhaps, maybe... Perchance. It's done emitting gas. It's definitely, possibly, maybe done. <laughs> and that's why we take two checks. The first thing we want to do is look at it. Now there's some brown gunk around the sides. That's croissant, that's coffee that's been stuck to the sides and whatnot. And then we smell it. I don't smell anything that shouldn't be there. I don't see anything growing or moving in there that shouldn't be in there. It smells like coffee though, that's for sure. So, you know, hey, we're at least on the right track. So what we're gonna do now, after I get some of the foam out. It's not gonna come out, I tried to get it out already. All right. Don't fear the foam. If you use Star Sand, Star Sand is a foaming sanitizer. So and it, it's a no rinse sanitizer. It foams on purpose. If you rinse it afterwards, you kind of defeated the purpose because the water from your tap could have pathogens and infectious things in it. Could, I didn't say does, could. And you know what? You can do it a thousand times and have no problem that thousand first time though. That's the one you gotta watch out for. Anyway, I'm gonna take a reading on this and I'm just using a hydrometer like we always do. This is so far from clear, it's ridiculous. <laughs> so we're either gonna probably use a clearing agent on this or give it a lot of time and see what happens. We may use a clearing agent on it eventually. Not today. The trick is to get your hydrometer floating there we go. All right. This started at 1.100 original gravity, and it is now at, oh, that's looking like 1.004. So we're taking a note on our note list with today's date and the gravity. Then because everything has been sanitized, we're going to put our sample back into our fermentation vessel. Carefully, not to slosh. Every drop is sacred. Except for those last ones, I'm not worried about them. <laughs> and we're going to put our lid and airlock back on. Now, 1.004, that could mean a lot of things. It could mean it's done. It could mean there's a little bit of non-fermentable sugars in there that it's not going to go any further. It could mean that it's stalled just a little bit. It's not a major stall, but it is a possibility. So. Right now, all we have is like one point in time. We don't have anything to compare it to. So we're gonna put this back in the fermentation station, let it sit for a whole week and check another reading. That way we have something to compare it to. Now that little bit of jostling that we did simply by taking the sample and putting the sample back in, I do see a bunch of little- oh, There's gas in there. Little bubbles coming up the sides. There's plenty of so gas. So that could simply be gas that is stuck in fermentation that are in solution that is escaping, which is part of the degassing process. Or it could be signs that perhaps it's not fully done. There is fermentation going. It's been three weeks. Slower. It's been a little cooler here, so yeah. 
Our house has been a few degrees cooler than normal, so it is possible that it's still going. Um, now, I'm going to date myself here, but when I was going to school, teachers always said, don't get used to having a calculator because you'll never have one at arm's reach. Well, I just reached in my pocket and pulled out a calculator, so I'm going to calculate what our ABV of this is. We started with 1.100 and it went to 1.004, and you just subtract the final gravity from the original gravity, get that, that's 0 0.096, multiply that by 135, some people use 131.25, I use 135. If you want to know why we have a video on that, it's because it's a little bit more accurate when you get to higher ABVs. That's it. Um, and that gives us 12.96. That's 13% as far as I'm concerned. Close enough. So it may change, may go up a little bit more, but it won't go down. Okay, that's the thing. Unless we dilute this, it won't go down. So it'll only go up from here. So at this point, we're going to let it sit. One, because this is just our first reading. So we don't know if it's done fermenting. And we want to make sure that we're positive that it's done fermenting because if we just went ahead and bottled it that's at this moment and it wasn't done fermenting, the continuing fermentation in those bottles is going to create gases, which is going to create pressure, which is going to create a boom explosion. So please don't do that. So it's been almost four weeks and well, it was pretty much ready last week. We just weren't ready to do it yet. And I wanted to see if it was going to clear out anymore, but the airlock activity has slowed down to like nothing. So it's time to take a reading on this, but this has been going for four weeks, but it's actually only been about a week since our last reading. If anybody has any questions, if we used real coffee, yes, yes we did. Oh wow, yeah, because it <laughs> sputtered up, it smells, smells like, like, oh wow, smells coffee. like coffee. Okay, coffee. so we're going to take our second reading. Our first reading was 1.004, so it's probably done. And you might be thinking, oh, but it didn't go all the way dry. Well, yeah, it's possible it could happen. Uh, we did use mangrove jacks yeast, so it should have gone dry, but yeah, sometimes it happens. It's okay. We probably will end up pasteurizing this anyway, so even if there's a little bit of sugars left in there, it's not a problem. I'm still seeing 1.004. So here's the thing, because this is never going to be closed up, we did two readings, they both came out at 1.004. I'm going to say this is as done as it's going to be at this point. So we're going to rack it. But what I want to do is pour this sample into the rackie rather than the racker. That way I don't disturb all the lease. Our racking procedure uses this tool, which is an auto siphon. We really like the auto siphon. We pretty much only use the auto siphon for racking and bottling, and we really can't think of something that would work just as well. They're also not crazy expensive, but if for some reason you can't afford one, just a piece of silicone tubing can work. You just have to find a way to submerge it and all that without losing too much fluid, and you definitely don't want to put your mouth on it to get that started. So to rack, you need your... Source. Source. The racker. And your destination. Racky. The destination should be lower than the source. That's why I'm placing Usually it. more lower, more lower. More Usually lower. even lower than that. But just for demonstration purposes, this is how we're doing it. The lower it is, the faster it will rack. And you just give it a few pumps until it's going. And then I like to stay at about the midpoint for a while until I can see what's going on. And then I'll tip the jar a little bit to get as much liquid as I can. The first racking, you're almost always going to get a little bit of sediment in there too. It's not a big deal. Don't get crazy. Um, but it is just something to be aware of. You're also going to have some amount of loss. The amount of loss is dependent on how brave into the lees you go. If you're gentle and you're paying close attention, you can actually limit the amount of loss and the amount of sediment into your new vessels. So. She's Make saying that, that because I'm usually not paying attention while I'm doing this. I'm daydreaming or thinking of something or talking, and I get more into there than I probably should, or I disturb the lease and get less than I should. As I'm racking this, I am seeing streams of solids in here. So we're going to do an extra step on this one to clarify it. I'll show you what we're going to do. All right, I went pretty deep in, and you can see there's only a little bit of liquid at the bottom, and this is so cloudy already, um, doesn't really matter. But uh, we're going to just clean this up, be right back to show you the next step. Okay, now for clarifying, we're going to use gelatin, and we've actually used this before on the show. To do it though, I'm, I heated some water. It's at about 135 to 140 degrees right now. That's perfect. You don't want to go past like the 150 mark. I'm just going to grab some plain old gelatin, 
food grade, of course. I, I think all gelatin is food grade. I don't know. Don't get the flavored stuff though. Pretty sure that'll just make your mead flavored, like whatever flavored gelatin you get, because you know that's what jello is, is gelatin. This is not opening well. Pouring the heck opening the heck out of this. You taped it. Yeah, I taped it up too good. Alright. So I just want like a teaspoon of gelatin, right? And I'm gonna dissolve it into this little bit of water, like that. We'll tape this sucker back up. Better, maybe. So you can get like three uses out of one package. You just want to dissolve it. That is the idea, is dis dissolving it. And this works pretty quick. Um, we are going to experimenting with bentonite, food grade only bentonite. Be careful because the non-food grade ones have other materials in there that aren't so good for you. Um, so we did get some food grade bentonite we're going to try as well. But I want, whoops, it's all in the thing. It like gelled up inside it. This is this is craziness. Do you need a chopstick? I might, because I'm burning myself here. Yeah, let me get a chopstick. Okay, the gelatin is gelling already. It does that. You want to dissolve it fully. And gelatin generally works in like 48 to 72 hours, where bentonite can take 7 to 14 days, depending. So this time around, I went with the gelatin idea. And I also didn't want to have to use as much water. You tend to need more water with bentonite. So I wanted to go with minimal. So here we go, because we did fill this pretty, pretty, pretty tight to the top there. And there we go. I'm just going to use the sanitized chopstick to mix that around real good, just to make sure that everything's in suspension. We're going to put our lid back on. And let this sit probably a week. I want to see this clear out fully before we uh, go to the next step. But uh, if it clears out in just a couple of days, we'll show you that too. And uh, we'll be back then to show you. All right, so it's been like five days. That means it's time to, uh, well, rack this off basically is the next step. Whew, smells like coffee. The gelatin, I want to talk about this for a second. We put it in and it usually takes 48 to 72 hours. It's been like five days, so it's a little longer than that. It cleared it but not a tremendous amount. Does that pose a problem for us? No, not at all. I don't personally feel that clearing is 100% necessary. We do it more often now just to show the techniques involved, but it's not absolutely a thing. To me, a coffee mel should be a little bit cloudy. Like they just, I don't know, it doesn't feel like something that's gonna get perfectly clear and that's okay. So the next step is going to be, we're gonna rack it from here into a pitcher so that we can uh, move to the next step. Racking, as we always do, is with an auto siphon. You've probably seen this before, and if you haven't, we have videos on it. We probably said that five times already in this video. I do have the cap on because all the gelatin and stuff that fell out is pretty thick on the bottom. So there's gonna be a tiny amount of loss with this rack, but it's okay. All right, after racking, we have about 120 ounces left. So pretty decent. You know, we're looking for one gallon, so that's not so bad. What we wanna do now is do our not superlative, not pejorative. Pre preliminary? No, there's a name for it. Pen right? Penultimate? Penultimate tasting, that's right, the penultimate tasting, the next to ultimate the tasting. The next to ultimate, right. Yeah, the, uh, all these words, the you know. The pre-ultimate, yeah. But anyway, <laughs> so we're gonna, words, you know. I'll put some in a glass and taste it. It looks like iced tea, it really does. It. Um, it's not very clear. I, I know we talk about this, but it does have some cloudiness to it. It definitely smells of black coffee, which I so don't. I'm gonna love it. I don't know how this is gonna work. Derica does drink coffee now, but not not like I do. <laughs> no. Oh yeah, that's coffee. <clears throat> Sorry, babe. You're not going to like this. It's got a lot of coffee character. I detect the slightest hint of honey, but not, not anything really to, uh, yeah. Let me just get rid of this. So, suffice to say, we're going to sweeten this. What I do think, though, is the acidity level is beautiful. Oh, yeah. It's got a lovely 
like strong coffee robustness character to it, but it needs some sweetness to back down the strength of it. Um, I personally feel coffee melt is best when sweet. Now this is 1.004, which according to the guidelines for me and set forth by the BJCP, as I talked about in another video, that makes this dry, okay? It's just, it's dry. <laughs> so we're looking to get this. It got me. <laughs> so we're looking to get this to a sweet, maybe even a, a semi-sweet. I'm looking for like a 1.015 to 1.020 or thereabouts. That's usually where my brain says, yeah, this tastes nice, but let's see. So we're gonna add some honey. And we selected honey as our sweetener of choice because this is a mead. This is coffee mouth. Right. So it should have the honey note along with the sweetness. Now, if this happened to have a lot of honey character and just needed more sweetness, we might maybe select sugar because all it's gonna add is sweetness. But generally in a mead, you're gonna want honey. But we have done it with just plain old sugar before. And again, not measuring the amount putting in, I wanna know the final result. So I'm just gonna put in a few glugs and this is starting to crystallize as you can see. Oh, that's maybe half pound or so. <laughs> yeah, it's starting to crystallize. All right, can I have a spoon please? <laughs> sure. I need to, my hands are sticky. When you're mixing like this, you just wanna be careful that you don't cause too much agitation at the surface. As Derek likes to say, I'm agitating the bottom, but not the surface. That way we're not oxygenating. Of course, anytime you do something like this, there is always a risk. However, this one came out to, it's 13%. The risk of vinegarization, slim to none. The risk of off flavors, that's the thing you want to be careful of. So I want to minimize the risk. Now, because this honey is starting to crystallize, there there are some blobs. There's some chunks in there. <laughs> it, it, it's chewy. <laughs> <laughs> now, that's, that's nothing wrong with that. That's, no, that's not something that. to be worried about. It just means it's going to take longer to mix thoroughly. Yeah, and since we don't really want to heat the mead yet, um, I don't want to do that to make it dissolve. That honey was sat in uh, an immersion circulator tub of water at like 110 degrees Fahrenheit for hours because it was totally crystallized. So the fact that it's pourable at all is actually pretty cool. Now, one thing that we didn't mention yet is now that we have added honey to this, we have added more fermentable sugars, which means this could re-ferment unless we stabilize in some way. Our preferred method of stabilization is pasteurization. It does a couple of things. One, it's going to kill the yeast. It doesn't just stop them from fermenting, it kills the yeast. To us, it helps as a clearing agent as well, and it has a mild aging effect. Not super strong, but it does tend to meld flavors a little bit. I mean by that is that it's not actually aging because the only yeah. way you can age something is by the time. usage of time but it does mimic some of the effects that you often find aging does so that's why i said an aging effect yeah um it just helps to mellow the flavors a little bit more that's all and we have done the pasteurization versus non-pasteurization flavor changes we actually preferred the one that was pasteurized yeah so it's not a conclusive test, but it uh, does give you an idea. So anybody that was worried that it ruins the flavors, it really doesn't. Um, if anything, it gives you another flavor way to play. How's that? So I have that in there and I have that mixed up pretty good, I think. Let's uh, get a taste. I don't really think that's gonna be enough. I think we're gonna need more. I just have a feeling, um, just cause. It smells the same. I'm not, I because of the sweetness, disparity, and this really isn't my thing, I'm gonna let Brian decide on whether the sweetness level is right or not. This has better sweetness. You wanna taste it now? It's It's got some sweetness to it. It's not bad. I still think it needs a bit more. If you don't want to, you don't have to. I don't want to. Okay. <laughs> right now, I would say it's probably at around like a 1.010 to 1.012. It's a little on the low side for what I want for this. So, more honey. Now please don't take my hesitation as the fact that this is a bad brew. No, if you like black coffee- She you, doesn't really like black coffee. You'll probably really enjoy this. 
And your stomach's been acting funny. And my too. stomach has been acting funny, yeah. That's gonna be a fun day. It's good. Be. All right, that's good. That's good. That's good. That's good. That's good. So that was probably another half pound, maybe a little bit over. That's how much I, a sweetness I think this has to have. Our original coffee mill that we made years ago actually stalled, and it ended up with a much higher. My, my hand sticky again. <clears throat> As I was starting to say, our original coffee mill that we made a few years ago actually stalled. I think it was like 1.060 or something. I, it, was, yeah. it was pretty high. And it actually ended up tasting wonderful. We still have some, I think. Uh, Derek used it I, to make cocktails. I've been using it, yeah. Yeah, it's a couple years old and it's wonderful. It's got a sweetness, but the coffee flavor is still coming through. And that's what I'm trying to do here, but make something that's repeatable. Something that we can teach you how to do rather than hope your stalls too. So um, yeah, cause that's not something I ever really wanna hope for. Yeah, there's some clumps in there. Again, this is chewy, you know. <laughs> when you do this, you can actually hear the crystals of the honey in the bottom. Like I know it's not fully mixed yet. Getting there though, we're very close. Honey will also add a viscosity and a body to uh, a mead or any beverage really. It makes it feel a little thicker and that makes it stick to you a little bit. Um, kind of a weird thing in tastings that you it, it sticks in your mouth. It doesn't just feel like water. Um, and that's an important aspect of tasting. Some things should be a little more thin, but you don't ever want to describe something as watery. We are mixed. Time for a taste. Derek's favorite part. Notice this pores are getting smaller because I know she's not drinking this. I'm not detecting a lot of honey character on the smell, but it's that could be time. Very coffee forward on the smell. Extraordinarily coffee forward. The coffee flavor is very, very strong in this. This would be great like over ice cream or something. Honestly, I think this is great for that. It's now getting to where it's nice. It's got a tang without it being cloyingly sweet but there's definitely like coffee honey flavors. A little bit of ethanol, not a tremendous amount. It's a good mix. I think it could go sweeter though. It's it's giving me a little bit of the dark chocolate. Oops, kind no. of, yeah. I, I want a little bit more sweetness, not a lot more, just a touch. I have a feeling I'm gonna be the one drinking this most of the time, so make it to what I appreciate. I don't know if we get more amaretto I'm making. Oh yeah, this mixed with amaretto would be lovely. Watching crystallized honey come out of the thing is just not attractive. <laughs> going to estimate that that should be enough. It's even changing the color slightly. It's a really dark honey. Yeah. That's a wildflower honey, so it should have more of a neutral-ish style of flavors for this. Whenever you're making something that's very strongly flavored, like coffee has a strong flavor, Try to use something that's more neutral. Like had we used an orange blossom honey. I don't think that'd be good. There'd be so much orange blossom honey have to go into it to get the sweetness level that that citrus hint might actually come through. And unless you like orange in your coffee, which I don't, unless you like that, then you really don't want to do that. So any neutral-ish uh, type of thing, clover, wildflower, things like that. Now, something to remember too, this came up in our VIP the other day. Somebody got an orange blossom honey and they said that it tasted like the medication that they took as a kid, like the orange uh, pills. the I'm thinking the St. Joseph's baby aspirin is what they meant. Um, I didn't get a chance to really read through the whole thing. But various honeys from various areas, even various times of year, and from year to year, can taste, can taste totally yeah. differently. Just because it says orange blossom doesn't mean that every orange blossom you taste is going to taste the same. Just as wildflower, I mean wildflower. There's only about a million different kinds of wildflowers, you know? So clover, uh, different times of year, it's gonna taste different from different places, it's gonna taste different. So every honey is different. Every batch of honey is a little bit different because it's a natural biological product. So just because you tried something once and you didn't like it, doesn't necessarily mean that you won't like it again, unless it was just horrible, like when we made the avocado one. That just, no. But I would try avocado blossom honey again. Just not that brand. Okay, we're mixed. And here we go. This should be the ultimate penultimate tasting. 
<laughs> These names, man. Okay, I finally get some more honey character on the nose. Um, definitely coffee, though. Oh, I like it. Good. Let's see what you think. I think I need a little bit more to make sure. Nice. Put some amaretto and cream in there and put on ice. <laughs> yeah. I'm getting a nice, rich honey flavor with the coffee coming in. It's not like all coffee now. There's definitely that balance. I think a little bit of thyme sitting to mellow. This is actually going to be really, really nice. So we're going to gonna... cheat with that thyme because we're going to put this in a one gallon fermenter and pasteurize it since we added all that honey. Now, if you're wondering how we pasteurize, we actually have a video on it, but let me just do it in a nutshell. We're going to put this into a one gallon fermenter, right? Leave the cap off. We're going to fill a pot with water. We're going to put an immersion circulator in and get the water to 140 degrees. I'm going to put this in there and let it go for close to 45 minutes to an hour until the internal temperature reads 140 degrees. That's all Fahrenheit, by the way. Let that sit at that temperature for 15 to 20 minutes, then take it out. That's it. That's all there is to pasteurization. And yes, we do it with the caps off. The reason why we're not showing you is because it's a whole ordeal. We'll try to do that. But we do have it in a video. And the reason we do it with the caps off is you lose an infinitesimally small amount of the alcohol. Don't, don't be fooled by, oh, ethanol boils at this. Don't, don't fall for any of that. A chemist told me that it doesn't really boil off as easily as you might think. And we're at 140 degrees Fahrenheit, which is far below where it boils off anyway. So do that. It's a safe way to go. Just remember, if you're going to heat your water on the stove instead of an immersion circulator, do not put your fermenter in while it's heating. Take it off the heat, then add your fermenter if you need to. The trick is, the really important part, is that 140 degrees Fahrenheit internal temperature for 15 to 20 minutes. If you maintain that, however you do it, it's pasteurized, the yeast are dead, we still put it back into uh, under airlock and put it back on the shelf and let it sit just to be on the safe side, but yeah. it's never failed us. But you also want to let it sit anyway because pasteurization will cause some fallout as uh, some of the particles in the heating process will bind together and yes. sell out. It'll help to clear it a little bit yep. more. So yeah, that's where we're at with that. And we'll be back to show you that finished product after it's sat for a little bit with a final tasting. All right, we almost forgot to give you the specific gravity reading. So I went ahead and put a sample in here and it came out to 1.032. So if you're trying to replicate this at home, add enough honey to get it to 1.032. And there you go. Okay, so we pasteurized this. It's been sitting for a couple of days. It uh, seems to have dropped out a whole bunch of fuzzy stuff at the bottom. It also. actually did a really great job in clearing out this brew. Yeah. Unfortunately, it got into the hands of me and oh. I'm a spasmo, so I jarred it. So our intention she was, was trying to move it when she put yeah, the water in. That's it, okay. Things happen, you know? But I was impressed by how clear it had gotten oh, simply by pasteurizing. And that's another thing, another benefit of pasteurization is that it does, in our experience, tend to get those particles to clump together and fall out of suspension. So, oh, heck yeah. Look at that. Yeah. That is infinitely clearer than what Yeah, the other day before. it was quite cloudy. Yeah. Now we did use... Um, not glycerin. Gelatin. Gelatin. I always want to say glycerin. We did use gelatin to clear this, and it did a decent job. I think, honestly, though, <laughs> pasteurizing did a better job than the gelatin did. So... Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah, on the color and clarity, this is perfectly clear. It's like a 9.5 for clarity. I mean, I can't imagine it being much clearer. Um, so, looks great. Color is awesome. It is coffee, but... It is coffee with honey. Yeah, it's more coffee than honey on the aroma. I really would have liked more, more aroma of honey on this, but I know we sweetened it a lot. I sweetened it up to 1.032. So it's considered sweet, okay? Um, some people would consider this like a dessert mead even. I don't know that it's that high because as much as that is the consideration of it, when you take into account the acidity, the tannins and things like that, 
it changes the perception of sweetness. That doesn't mean it's not sweet, because the sweetness is there, and that's a, that's a real measurable thing. The perception can be different, and that's why different brews require different sweetness levels. Right, and that's why a lot of times when we get asked, well, how sweet or how dry should this be, we can't give you a definitive answer because that perception word gets in the way of, yeah. of, of conveying that information because what is sweet to us or what is dry to us may be perceived quite differently to you. So again, that's why we do what we do the way we do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so on the aroma, I'm getting a young coffee, kind of not a deep roast coffee. I probably would have liked to have used a dark roast for this. I think this is more of a medium roast or even a light roast on the coffee. Um, Cause that's the smell I'm getting. It's not that deep, rich, chocolatey roast that I like. I'm not complaining, and I'm not saying that Mark did anything wrong when he sent me that coffee. He did a wonderful job. But it does have a, a higher acidity level in the scent and things like that, and that's what's coming through. So right off, if I was to do this again, I'd use a dark, dark roast, like a, an espresso roast. Uber dark. Yeah, uber dark. There you go. I'm going in. On the flavor, though. It's balanced. It's really nicely balanced. It's interesting, that aroma will throw you. You'll think this is gonna be bitter and astringent and strong, but it's not at all. It actually, Yeah. I mean, I'll just, here, I'll take you on a trip. Before Brian gets too verbose, I wanna say the one thing that strikes me right up from the front, the beginning of the tasting, is how the honey notes and the coffee notes are equal in yeah. dignity. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But As it enters your mouth, you definitely know this is coffee, but you also definitely know this is a honey-based beverage. Now, at 13%, it's not, it's no wuss. I mean, it's got a decent amount of ethanol to it to carry everything through. And what I'm getting in the beginning is that strong coffee flavor with a great honey flavor. And then I do get a tinge of the tang from the ethanol coming through. And those three things actually play well together. As it gets into my mouth, I get a little tiny hint of like a dark chocolate, not a lot, maybe a little bit of a cherry even. Um, as it goes further, the astringency of the coffee comes a little bit more prominent. It's more like a, a palate cleansing kind of thing than a than bad, so don't, don't take that wrong. Let me get another sip to refresh. And as it starts to go towards the end, that cherry note comes back again. Yep. Got a little bit of cherry towards the back end. And the finish on this is very long. It stays with you. On the exhale, I'm still getting a good honey character, a really nice um, astringent note from the coffee. Those things are in perfect balance. As Derica said, the honey character and the coffee notes are actually pretty even. Um, neither one of them is overpowering. And that's kind of an often problem with the coffee melt is the coffee will overtake or there's not enough coffee. In this case, I think we nailed that perfect balance yeah. of enough coffee to enough honey. Had we not sweetened it so much, we would not have gotten there. It actually took quite a bit of sweetening to get it to yeah. match that balance. But because it's a more green coffee, um, it's, it's hand roasted, so I can't really say exactly what the roast is, but I, I'm fairly certain it's a lighter roast. It has more acidity and more brightness to the character of the coffee. It's a little more astringent, so it required more sweetness to kind of balance it and tone it down. I, I don't know if I'd want to use a dark roast coffee on it now. I mean, it'd be I, a whole different beverage. Yeah. It wouldn't be the same. It'd be a different kind of coffee melt. I, I can't complain. I, and I agree with Brian on that. Even though we've mentioned before, I'm not truly a fan of just a straight black coffee. Now that we have sweetened this, it has brought it to a place that I'm more happy with. Um, I also think that the pasteurizing mellowed the flavors a little bit. It did, it did. Brought them closer together. But because of that youth of the coffee that you're, you're talking about, the acidity yep. of the coffee, I think that is really working in favor of this particular brew as it's giving it another note where if that was right. absent, it, it might mm -hmm. fall flat. Uh, another thing, uh, as well as the flavors being very strong, very prominent and lasting and staying with you, you also get the tactile sensation mm. of the brew staying mm -hmm. with you as well. And so that's really nice to have those two pairings linger in your mouth. So it, I'm... It's got a great viscosity. Yeah. 
But when we look at balance, when we say balance, we mean acid, sweetness, and tannin. The tannic quality of this is not so much that it's mouth puckering, but it adds a fullness and a richness that a greener coffee needs. It needs to have some of that. Um, the acidity level was always going to be high. And I knew that from the time we tasted this coffee, the acidity level is going to be high. So we had to make sure that the tannins match that. And I think using the whole the whole coffee in the cold brew process actually helped to give it more of that body by key, and keeping these acids level down just a little bit. Because when you make cold brew, the acid level is lower in coffee. And then, like I say, the sweetening, we just had to get all three of those to kind of, you're just like playing with the dials, you know, you're just, you're just tuning things just right. And we had two fixed points and that was the acidity and the tannins. You, we could make more tannin, we could make more acidity, but we couldn't bring them back down. So because of that, we had to bring the, the sweetness levels up, but there also was not enough honey character when we first right. tasted it. Right. It was like coffee with alcohol. It really didn't have much up. much honey at all. It was not pleasant. Punch of coffee. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it'll wake you up, but it was not, it'll wake you up and put you to sleep at the same time. <laughs> that comes up a lot. People ask, does the caffeine stay? Yes, actually it does. Uh, from everything that I've read, the caffeine is still in there. So it doesn't make you sleepy. It just kind of keeps you even keeled. I don't, I don't know how that works, to be honest with you. I think if you drink enough of this, you're still going to get drunk and you're still going to pass out. But, you know, I don't think it's going to keep you awake. We don't recommend away. that, so yeah. don't do that. Like, you know, the old idea that drink coffee to get sober, that doesn't actually work. You just have a wide awake drunk. It doesn't <laughs> actually sober you up. So you'll be a wide awake drunk if you drink too much of this. Before we give this a score, I need to get another sample for science. Do you have a number? Oh, a number. Shoot. Got sideline there. I need I need some of your sample now. Yeah, we um we were gone for a minute to look to see if we had any of the older coffee mill left, and um, apparently Derek drank it all. All right, our scoring goes from one through ten, with sometimes eleven. One means basically it sucks. You're just gonna dump it out, never never touch it again. Probably never admit that you made it. Ten means this is just absolutely great. There's nothing you would change. And 11 just means it's like a step above even that. Okay. And then in between is varying levels of ick to awe. And for me, like a five is average. Okay. So that's pretty much the gist of our scoring. Um, do you have a number? I do. All right. One, two, three, eight. Six point five. I knew she was going to go a little lower. This isn't really her thing. <laughs> now, this is my number for it on its own. However, my number on it as a mixer to create something else. I think it's much better as a mixer. Is like a 13 because this has got such a wonderful, strong flavor that adding a multitude of things, which I have an experimentation done in the past, which is why the original coffee mill is all gone, turns into a delightful experience. So my 6.5 is strictly on if I just had this by itself in a glass. I, I could only take so much. I would still enjoy the experience of it, but I, I could only take so much. However, combine it with some critical elements and I could probably drink way too much of it. Now, I like to classify things as like a sipper, a drinker, and a chugger. This is certainly not a chugger. It's not even a drinker. This is a sipper. You definitely put some of this in a glass and you experience it. Derek likes to call them an experience. Yeah. This is definitely that. I, I'd have to agree. So... If we wanted to alter this a little bit, we did find something in our searching that we only have a little bit left of that might seem like an odd thing to add, and that is Kahlua, which is a coffee liqueur. But my thought is the coffee liqueur part, it's almost a creamy thing. And it's got rum. Oh, and it has rum in it. You can't go wrong with rum. Yeah, so we're going to add some of this. Pretty good amount. Not all of it, just some. Some of the rum. It changes the color drastically, but it's got sweetening in it too, which is unique. I'd say we have, what, like a three, maybe a four to one ratio here. It changes the smell. Ch smells more like chocolate milk now. Not completely, but closer. It doesn't look attractive. I'll, I'll admit that. But it took that coffee flavor took the acidity away, 
gave it the dark chocolate notes, the chocolatey notes. That right there, that's a 12. I mean, that is spectacularly good now. Yeah, it is. So if you make this and, you're, and it's too acidic for you, if you don't really appreciate it, you can add a little Kahlua to it and see if you can tone that down a bit. Or you can check out my list of coffee mill cocktails and make something fancy. That sounded very much like an ad. But I guess I guess it sort of is. I mean, you know, we we have to market our own stuff too. You know, our videos. They were videos. really good. So yeah, they were. They, I'm not that, just. Yeah, they were good. They were good. Go do that. <laughs> but yeah, and that's something that we're trying to get into. Is yeah. See, now she's going back for more. See, that tells you how different that just became. This is something that we're starting to do now. I like this as is, and I don't know that I would fortify this with Kahlua before I bottled it. But I don't have any problem adding a little Kahlua to it when I go to drink it. Because now it's a cocktail and it's something unique and different, but I still have the original to play with too. Yeah. Like what Derica intends to do is add amaretto and cream to this and make stuff like that. And I, I think that's a great way to go. If you can't, if you don't want to drink your mead as just a straight mead, pour it in a horn and, you know, down the whole thing, have fun with it. Enjoy it your way. And if anybody ever tells you that you're wrong, say, it's my mead. I made it. I can drink it how I want to. Right. You know, <laughs> that's just the way that works. But um, as always, guys, thank you so much for watching and have a great day. Bye bye.